Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel. I already cut the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan Nixon Sano, and it's the 26th of May, 2023. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So starting off today's episode, we have a fresh recap thread of the latest Ethereum or core devs call from Tim Biko here. Now, what they covered on this call was mostly got to do with the removal of something called self-destruct, which I'll talk a little bit about, more about in a sec. Uh, some 4844 spec changes, opcode management, and potential final Cancun additions. Now, the self-destruct stuff is mostly or pretty much all got to do with developers. It's not something that an end user generally kind of interacts with or really cares about. So if you're a developer, if you're someone just curious, there is a great thread here from uh, Ddorb, Ddorb, I think is how you say it, uh, where they say next version of, of Ethereum or, or the um, the Denkun upgrade will remove self-destruct, allowing a future transition to vertical trees. The Ethereum team uh, had, had asked them to establish to what extent will this break existing protocol and this is their summary of uh, of what they found. So basically this shows that there are some protocols that will unfortunately be broken by this because they're using self-destruct as part of their code base, uh, but the impact can range from low to high. And you can see on this table here that some projects are impact impacted more than others. And obviously a lot of these projects can just upgrade or change their contracts around to, to basically rectify this. Now, this is something that Ethereum the, as a network has done in the past where basically removing or changing an opcode has resulted in certain contracts breaking. And I don't think, I mean, there are some people who say this goes against the immutability of Ethereum. I think like there is an argument to be made there, but at the same time, the self-destruct opcode actually leads to more negative stuff than positive stuff on the network and it actually harms the network. So removing it is being done for the health of the Ethereum network and it should never have really been put in in the first place. And it has been recommended not to use self-destruct for a long time now as part of your code base and anyone ignoring those recommendations did so at their own risk because there is strong consensus around removing this uh, this kind of opcode here. So as I said, it is most likely, I, I believe, getting removed or changed in, in such way, some way here. And you can read this thread to see all about that and the impact on that. Uh, but that's what was basically discussed for most of the call yesterday. There's also some news on 4844. I believe that they're getting ready to spin up DevNet 6. Uh, I think there was something here from Tim about, yeah, DevNet 6 will be the last 4844 exclusive DevNet. And then after that, they'll start pulling in other EIPs to test as well. So, so far, the DevNets have only been testing 4844, but obviously they want to begin testing on the other EIPs that are slated for inclusion in the Denkun upgrade. And then after the DevNets, we'll, we'll move on to private test nets and then, or I guess like permission test nets and then... A permissionless test nets and then the the live test nets and then mainnet of course. I'm I'm still expecting this to go live on mainnet uh, probably Q4 at this rate. I'm not sure exactly when in Q4, but 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 Q4 nonetheless. Uh, but you can read Tim's thread for the full recap of the call as well as his thread from Ddorb for an, the impact of what uh, removing self destruct will have on the network. All right, moving on to a quick FAQ from Domothy. So this FAQ was answering some common questions that Domothy has seen about the idea of burning MEV. Now, MEV burn has been the talk of the town, I guess, for the last few months, especially since Domothy first proposed it. It has gone through a bunch of iterations and changes since then. Um, so that's why Domothy put together this FAQ that basically answers all the questions you have around it. And this is pretty detailed. I highly recommend giving this a read if you're interested in learning all about uh, MEV burn and you know, maybe you have questions that are answered on here as well. Uh, this thing that stuck out most to me was, was something that was highlighted in the Daily Grey Discord channel as well. So I think that uh, there was a calculation done that uh, if we had burned the MEV, uh, yeah, so it, it, here, as of early May 2023, it is estimated that burning the MEV since the merge, so since, since September 15th last year, would have resulted in the supply of ETH declining roughly three times faster. So it would have been a huge, I guess, like burn on top of the already big burn of ETH uh, since the merge if we had burned MEV instead of... Uh, giving it obviously to to uh, validators and uh, and the MEV Boost network. Now, in saying that, as I've said before, I still want to reiterate this point that MEV burn isn't d being done primarily to drive value to ETH or to just burn ETH so that we can burn more ETH and, and make ETH more deflationary. It's being done in conjunction with things like uh, PBS or proposed builder separation because we want to remove as many of these negative externalities that MEV generates on the Ethereum network as possible. So MEV burn is obviously one way to do that. And you can read this 
FAQ from Domothy to get a full breakdown on that below. Now, speaking of PBS, there is a new post here. So, Mike, uh, who works at the Ethereum Foundation, has put out a tweet saying, I'm super stoked to share a new piece written with Ad Justin Drake on the past, pre present, and future of PBS. So if you're curious about the relationships between MEV Boost, EPBS, and Optimistic Relaying, you can check out this post on ETH Research. Now, again, highly recommend reading this post for yourself. It goes through basically the pros and cons of EPBS. Uh, so propose a builder separation here and how th that will uh, lead to a healthier and more MEV resistant uh, Ethereum network. Uh, and, it, and I mean, it's quite a lengthy post. It's quite technical, but it's not so technical that you need to know fancy math or anything like that. Uh, so I highly recommend giving this a read if you, if you haven't yet. Now, as I said, like this goes hand in hand with something like MEV burn, and this is going to be a big, big part or a, of the uh, general kind of, I guess, work being done on the core protocol next year. So this year was all about getting withdrawals done, laying the groundwork for vertical trees, uh, and also obviously put, putting in 4844. I think next year and possibly the year after that is definitely going to be mostly about these uh, mo much more, I guess, like less end user facing things uh, and more, I guess, like core protocol, core network facing things like PBS, like MEV burn, like single slot finality, like vertical trees, because a lot of this stuff all feeds in into each other. Uh, this current design for EPBS, as far as uh, I understand from this post can't actually go forward without single slot finality being put in the network and it's part of the the scourge uh, kind of roadmap item here, which also includes things like MEV burn. Now, MEV burn is not, from my understanding, a necessity for this, but it's something that they would obviously like to get in at the same time. And this is going to take a, a, a bit of testing, of course. Uh, so I don't know if it's going to happen early next year. It may end up happening late next year, but this is something that is going to obviously be the focus of core developers uh, and researchers uh, for next year and possibly the year after as well. It is critically important that we get this sort of stuff uh, deployed onto the network and make sure that we can make the Ethereum network much healthier. I, I ranted about this, I don't know if it was this week or last week, about how people were saying that they wanted the MEV payments to remain because they were getting nice rewards being an ETH staker or an ETH validator. And I basically said that I think that Ethereum network should do what's best for the, the network or the Ethereum ecosystem should do what's best for the network. First and foremost, then worry about the other, uh, I guess, stakeholders in the network. Because at the end of the day, if MEV isn't dealt with uh, in, I guess, like a proper healthy way, the logical end state of the Ethereum network and of any network that has MEV on it, which is pretty much any network that has anything of value to be extracted, uh, ends up death spiraling and it could potentially kill the, the network altogether because it leads to instability of consensus. That is basically the worst case scenario. And what and the practical outcome of that is reorgs. And reorgs are obviously not great. Uh, and not great for a number of different reasons, and I've discussed this before, but having things like single slot finality and PBS and MEV burn are going to greatly diminish those risks, as well as just making the Ethereum network overall more healthy and making it so that the Ethereum, and this is particularly um, important for Ethereum core developers and researchers, so that they don't have to pay attention to this out of protocol software known as MEV boost, because as I've explained before, MEV boost is out of protocol sidecar software, but it is so dominant across the network, over 90% of validators I think use it, that it basically is part of the core protocol from a perspective of a core developer and researcher having to test things using MEV Boost and making sure they account for edge cases with MEV Boost, making sure they account for the MEV Boost network being able to work with any uh, uh, further upgrades after a hard fork. So it is definitely something that I think that the core devs and researchers are interested in just enshrining as part of the core protocol with PBS instead of allowing to exist as sidecar software because then it becomes a lot easier to reason about and manage when doing things like uh, upgrading the Ethereum core protocol and it becomes much healthier for the network overall. But anyway, as I mentioned, you can read this uh, new post here. I'll link it in the YouTube description, uh, description below for you to do so. All right, so Eric Connor today put out a great tweet that I thought was worth discussing. He said, years ago, Sassel 0 x and I often discussed the three pillars of ETH value accrual. Those three pillars are trustless collateral for DeFi, staking returns via network security, and fee burn based on usage. It's beautiful to see them all working cohesively today. ETH is a thing of beauty. 
So the amazing thing about this is that we were discussing this all the way back in 2019. It may have even been 2018 when we were discussing this. And what's amazing about that is that ETH use as trustless collateral within DeFi in 2019 was very muted. There wasn't much going on at all. And it was really dominated by just Maker. I think Maker had like over 90% of all the TVL of Ethereum-based DeFi. Um, there was no proof of stake network that was live. That went live in, in December of 2020. And there was, of course, no fee burn because that went live in August of 2021. But in saying that, these things that we were talking about were in progress from when we were talking about them in 2018 and 2019. And that was our major bull case at the time. And obviously, the price of ETH was pretty depressed during 2019. It had a little pump, uh, I guess, like into the middle of the year, but then bled out uh, again uh, later in the year and obviously bled out pretty hard against Bitcoin as well. Uh, but we always believed in these three core pillars for ETH value accrual that fed into things like ETH be becoming a store of value and accruing a monetary premium and, and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I think that when we look back on this and look back on how far we've come, it's just great to see that they're all working so cohesively today, right? We have a massive DeFi ecosystem with Ethereum, within Ethereum that just keeps growing and growing as, as time goes on. ETH is still used as pristine collateral within that ecosystem. And now obviously we also have LSTs, which are used as collateral uh, as well. Uh, staking returns, obviously proof of stake has been live for quite a while now, since December, 2020. We had the merge go through and the APR has shot up because of the execution layer rewards going to stake instead of miners. And proof of work is a, a distant memory at this, at, at this stage for Ethereum. And then fee burn based on usage. Well, we've had that for a while now. It's almost, I mean, it's gonna be two years in August since we've had EIP1559, and it is worked, it has worked way better than we ever thought it could. Like in 2019, the fees on Ethereum L1 were not that high. So the most optimistic, I think, uh, uh, fee burn projections were, were, not, were nowhere near what they were, what they have been since 1559 went live because DeFi Summit came in 2020 and that's when the, the high fees started. Um, so that's just been an amazing success as well. And that's all fed into everything else within a, within ETH as an asset, such as it becoming, as I said, a store of value and, a, and having a monetary premium. And also just looking back and seeing how hated ETH was as an asset back in 2019 and even 2020 to today where ETH is considered the premier asset to own within crypto. I mean, obviously you have BTC as well, but there are a lot of people out there who are very, very vocal about ETH being... Um, better as an asset than BTC. Obviously, I am one of those people, right? Uh, and we've seen this bear market how the ETH BTC ratio has really stayed relatively flat. Whereas in the last bear market, it nuked like almost 90%, I think, from its from its high, uh, which I think is an incredibly positive signal for ETH's value accrual, not just against USD, but against BTC. Because as I've said, when you're measuring different assets within crypto and you're trading and investing in them, you want to have obviously a fiat benchmark, but you also want to have a crypto benchmark. And the only two crypto cryptos that I benchmark things against are BTC and ETH. I only benchmark uh, most things against ETH, but then I obviously benchmark ETH against BTC. And if I if ETH is not outperforming BTC over the long term, then it was no there was no point owning ETH over BTC. But in saying that, you also have to factor in things like staking returns. You also have to factor in things like holding ETH gives you uh, much more exposure to uh, other ecosystems like like Ethereum and, and L2s and other L1s. And that brings with it more opportunities to to profit and make money. Uh, so I think ETH, I mean, ETH has, has outperformed Bitcoin for most of its life. And I, I, I expect it to continue, continue doing that, especially into a bull market. Uh, but it's just night and day difference between what it was in 19, 2019 and 2020 to what it is uh, today. So yeah, just great for Eric to bring that up there. And it kind of was a bit nostalgic for me as well, because a lot of you will know that Eric and I ran something called ETH Hub. Uh, and we ran an, uh, a podcast called In to the ether, which was a weekly recap of all things that were happening in Ethereum, where Eric and I just bounced off of each other for 45 minutes and talked about uh, everything that was happening. I miss doing those episodes. Uh, maybe it comes back one day. I don't know. Uh, but I know uh, those were the episodes where we discussed a lot of these things. But obviously, I've continued on the work with the Daily Gway and continued to carry the torch there. All right, so this is one for the developers out there. Anyone interested in decoding the EVM? So Bytes032 has put together an EVM handbook. So basically, this is a pretty extensive handbook of everything you've got to do with the EVM and all the moving parts around it, such as solidity, uh, memory, storage, all that good stuff there. So not much more for me to say on this other than 
you should definitely go check this out because I figured it was just very interesting for people who were interested who were uh, interested in learning about the EVM and, and especially developers out there. But for someone like me who I guess is less technical and not a developer. It's it's not something that I will be using personally, but it's definitely something that I think that you guys should go check out. So I'll link that in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so you can now participate in the KZG ceremony if you have only sent 16 transactions uh, or more in the past. So I've been covering the KZG ceremony for many months now. We are almost at 100,000 total contributions. We're at 99,700. And you know, the most amazing thing about this is that I don't know if I said it on the refill, but I did say to some friends that I expected us to get to at least 100,000 total contributions throughout the entire contribution phase of the KZG ceremony. And we are pretty much there. So just amazing to see that turnout. I know there are, uh, you know, th there is a lot of contributions that are probably attributed to uh, people farming an airdrop when there's not going to be an airdrop for this, but obviously people don't want to uh, don't want to um, uh, take the chance of maybe there is one. You know, even if there is like a 0.1% chance of some kind of airdrop, then uh, I guess it's worth it. And the funny thing is, is that the KZG ceremony, um, uh, I guess like coordinators themselves don't have to airdrop anything. Other people from other ecosystems and projects can basically say, okay, well, you're eligible for an airdrop of our token because you contributed to the KZG ceremony. So it still works in either way here. But the contributions, I think, um, will be sorted and filtered out and, and things like that as well. And obviously, we'll know uh, um, uh, how, which ones are the strong ones, which ones are the weak ones. But as I've mentioned before, you only need to have one honest contribution out of the entire set. It's a one of N trust assumption out of the entire set for the KZG ceremony to be secure and trustless. So... If you trust that your contribution was uh, uh, was done properly, then that's it. You don't have to trust uh, any of the other contributions out there, which I, I, I've thought is pretty, pretty cool. But uh, but yeah, if you have an address that has only done 16 transactions, you can now uh, uh, contribute to the KZG ceremony. And maybe you tried to contribute originally back a few months ago and you weren't successful. Well, there are zero participants in the queue right now, or I should say in the lobby because it was it's not actually a queue. So you should be able to contribute straight away. So I'll, I'll leave this link in the YouTube description below for you to to do that. All right, so Ryan Berkman has given us an update on the tokenized US Treasury bills that are thriving on Ethereum. So he's put together this little fact sheet where he said TVL has gone from $0 to $200 million in three and a half months. There's half a dozen good competitors with more coming, and the yield is around 4.75% plus. Uh, so, but today, direct access is usually whitelisted for qualified investors, both US based and non US based, but yield arbitrage and treasuries looping similar to STE looping and driving up stablecoin uh, stable yields towards T-bill yields. See unincentivized 3.8% USDC yield on uh, on Flux, uh, which is a fork of Compound V2. Uh, and StakeFi also has uh, made an excellent T-bill dashboard for you to track this. So this is really cool. I guess it's natural that this sort of stuff would be taking off within uh, DeFi uh, right now, considering that uh, treasury yields are so high. Obviously, when rates were low, the treasury yields weren't great. But now that the rates are, are much higher, treasury yields are much more, uh, I guess, um, appealing to people. And it's great to see this coming into uh, into Ethereum and, and growing so fast. I mean, zero to 200 million in three and a half months uh, is is great. I mean, I, I, think, I believe a lot of that is unincentivized as well. Most of it is probably unincentivized. And as I said, there is this dashboard here from Steakhouse that you can go check out. The, uh, everything got to do with this, like the protocols doing it. Uh, and you can see here, the, the protocols and different products doing the uh, the, the bills here, uh, the market caps of each of them. So it seems like Ondo and Matrix Doc are the leaders uh, right now. And you can see that there. You can see the growth over time. So, I mean, it's really just been like up up only most of it, most of the growth here. And then there's a bunch of other metrics here. So, I'll, I mean, I'll link the dashboard in the YouTube description below for you guys. Uh, but this is great to see. I've said before that I thought that this year and next year particularly, we're going to be a really strong year, or really strong years for real world assets within the Ethereum ecosystem or in the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem. And there's actually one other narrative within DeFi that I've been paying a lot of attention to lately. And that's this concept of, uh, I guess, minimal DeFi protocols. And what I mean by that is DeFi protocols that don't rely uh, on oracles, that don't rely on governance, that don't rely on these centralized points of failure, these true kind of DeFi protocols that can be rather autonomous. So something like Unisoft, for example, where it can be immutable, it can be autonomous. It doesn't need an oracle. It doesn't need centralized control and centralized, uh, you know, pseudo centralized governance and, and, and stuff like that, uh, or pseudo decentralized governance, I should say. 
So I think those two things are definitely something to pay attention uh, to, especially the real world asset stuff. Because at the end of the day, as I've said, it can't just be like the crypto native assets like if we want to expand DeFi, if we want the DeFi to become the global backbone of a new financial system, then it has to incorporate every asset. It can't just be limited to digital assets and I guess like digitally native assets. We have to digitize or bring the other assets such as stocks and treasury yields and bonds and and real estate and everything like that into the crypto world, into the DeFi world. And that's how Ethereum becomes the global sediment layer by just being that backbone. But for that to happen, obviously we need people to go out there and do it. And it's great to see that there are projects working on this and they're actually getting traction. They're not just dead in the water and, and trying to get traction. They're actually getting traction, even though it's obviously relatively small at 200 million, but it's more about the growth trajectory, which has been pretty fantastic here. And obviously, uh, uh, you know, I expect this growth to continue and i think it will if, if rates remain high for quite a while the treasury bill yields will actually uh, be quite popular i think for a while and even if they um uh uh, even if they go low again, hopefully we get some clarity around tokenizing things like uh, like stocks and being able to trade them. So that's more real world assets that can come on chain. But we already have a huge amount of real world assets on chain in, in stable coins, obviously USDC, USDT and other centralized stable coins. But I personally am much more interested in non-currency uh, real world assets because those are the things that we haven't traditionally seen being uh, brought into crypto just yet. But anyway, you can go check out all of this. I'll link it in the YouTube. YouTube description below. All right, Mon Monet Supply has put out a tweet uh, in case we missed that saying that USDC is now around 25% of diebacking down from over 40% one month ago and 50 plus percent for much of the past year. The die collateral basket is becoming increasingly diversified. This is really great to see. I think that the caveat here is that while USDC is down, there are other stable coins like GUSD and USDP, which have kind of filled that gap and other centralized stable coins, I should say say. Um, and there are obviously other real world assets as well, we, as you can see here that have filled that gap too. So most of the basket, from what I can tell here, is still centralized assets. But the thing is, is I, I said this a while ago, I said that it's a concern when it's only one centralized asset being the backer of most of the, I guess, like being the collateral for most of the die. But it's much less of a concern when you have uh, disconnected centralized assets being backing up the the thing, right? So if you have like 10 centralized assets backing DAI in equal proportions, let's say they all have 10% share each, that is much better than DAI being backed by 50 plus percent just of USDC and 50% of uh, maybe decentralized collateral, maybe 25% ETH and 25% something else, right? So from that perspective, this is a lot healthier. Uh, it's a lot healthier version of Dai. And as I mentioned before, Dai needs to scale and needs to continue scaling. And I, and I don't think it can do that by just having ETH only as collateral or just decentralized assets as collateral. It needs to have everything. And I'm fine with that. But I think people just need to be aware that Dai is not a truly decentralized stablecoin anymore. But that's that's okay. I actually don't think that a stablecoin has to be truly decentralized for it to be successful. We've seen plenty of examples of this. But I do. do think we can do a lot better than what we've seen with USDC and USDT. They're great. They serve a purpose. But if we want something that's a lot more resilient and actually, you know, not just totally centralized within one company or one entity, then we obviously want to see things like DAI succeed and be backed by many different types of collateral, which is exactly what we've been seeing. And I hope that this trend continues. So great uh, tweet from Monet Supply here, just to put this back on our radar. All right, Astaria has launched. So they announced that they have launched today, the 20, or I guess yesterday, the 25th of uh, of May here. So Astaria is a novel NFT-backed lending protocol, and I've talked about them on the refill before, and I've also disclosed that I'm an investor in them before. So basically, Astaria is a bor borrower-centric platform with instant liquidity, fixed terms, and no forced liquidations. You can simply borrow from the supported collections, and there are a bunch of uh, popular NFT collections that are supported here. Uh, liquidity providers at the deposit one ETH into the uh, into these pools here. We'll receive an LSD token redeemable in July for a piece of physical blotter paper, uh, which you can see here as well. So there are incentives going on here uh, to, to basically, obviously, incentivize usage in the Astaria protocol. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can go check this out for yourself at the link here at astaria.xyz. But this is really cool. I, I'm glad to see that this, this is live. I know there are other NFT, I guess, 
uh, money markets, I guess you could call them, or the borrowing and lending platforms out there. Uh, but Astaria, uh, obviously, I'm a backer in them, so anything I say is probably going to be biased here. But Astaria is, is great because I think it's been built by true crypto natives that have built products before and that have been very involved with crypto before. Um, one of the founders is Justin Bram, who you'll know from his YouTube channel where he did a lot of great DeFi videos. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable in all things uh, crypto. And then also Joseph DeLong, who was at Sushi for a while. And before that, he was an Ethereum core developer. So these people have a lot of experience in building products, bringing them to markets, uh, and are very crypto native. So I, I just love seeing that. I love seeing that they've built something uh, 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 exciting in the NFT infrastructure space. And I'm very curious to see what kind of traction they get, uh, especially in this massive NFT bear market that's currently underway. Because yeah, NFTs are pretty much in the worst spot that they've ever been in. But the funny thing is, is that they're still in a much better spot than they were just a couple of years ago. So it's more of that kind of, they have their, their slow growth period and they have like their massively inflated uh, uh, growth period and they come back down and they, they have this kind of like peak of disillusionment where... Most people aren't interested in it anymore, but people are still building stuff to uh, add more value to the NFT ecosystem, which is exactly what Astaria is doing. So I do think Astaria is going to be a big player uh, when obviously interest comes back for, for NFTs in a big way, which I don't think is is too far away. I do think interest in NFTs comes back with the general bull market um, because there is a lot of value there, not just for things like collectibles, but anything unique that can be brought on chain. So definitely go check out Astaria for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, last up here, just a shout out. I am doing a Twitter Spaces with Obel Labs next week. We're going to be talking all about solo staking, staking in general, distributed validator technology, uh, my experience and the people that are going to be on the Spaces with me is experience with setting up an Obel cluster uh, and be, being part of a distributed validator uh, set here. So if you're interested in that, I'll link it in the YouTube description below and you can set a reminder. It's going to be at 4 p.m. on uh, Thursday, June 1st. So 4 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. But if you go to the link to the Twitter spaces, you'll actually be able to see the time in your in your local time. And of course, it will be automatically recorded anyway. So if you miss it, you can check it out there. And I'll be sure to link it to you guys once it happens. But yeah, this is going to be happening next Thursday, 4 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. But on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone.